Welcome to WinCam's webinar series number five. Uh, I am recording this. I don't know if it's going to be appropriate for a YouTube or website video because we're going to bounce around to a lot of different things. Um, the subject of this webinar is Ask WinCams Anything. So basically, it's just any question you have about how to use WinCams, how to um, do anything. I'm going to try to stay away from super specific things about your particular environment, um, like, like uh, this employee doesn't have the right labor rate. I'd rather back up and say, how do we calculate a labor rate? Where, does, where do we get the labor rate? How do I investigate that, right? Um, because I may not have a very good copy of your data and I, I just would rather stay at that level that, that might help other people. Um, I've received about 20 questions here, um, 21 questions uh, via email from people. Many of the questions I received, I had to kind of weed out because they're more like, could wind cams butter my bread and make my eggs in the morning and et cetera, et cetera, which are great uh, suggestions and I'm happy to discuss them with any of you. But, um, and, and sometimes we can discuss them here. That's, I mean, you know, maybe there's a, a you know, why doesn't it do this or, or things like that. But um, a lot of times that ends up into a discussion of, well, how would that work and a back and forth and maybe a cost quote or whatever. Okay, so um, if I mess up and don't understand your question or don't get to your question or whatever, please email me and we'll do it uh, off outside the webinar. Um, if you don't understand something, uh, please ask questions in the chat window. I have muted everyone else um, just so that people don't don't talk to don't or don't uh, not so that people don't talk so that they don't talk over each other, etc. I think it's hard with uh, with a bunch of people, but you're welcome to ask questions either about what I'm doing in the chat window or if you just didn't email me your question, just go ahead and ask your question and I'll try to keep up with um, with things. Okay. Um, okay, so let's get started. And remember, the, the most important thing to me is that there are no stupid questions. So there's not going to be any judgment about you should already know that or or why are you asking that. We'll we'll try to be as uh, accepting as possible. Um, so we'll just see where we get to. So Darlene at Wakayakum in Washington has an accrual question. Um, am I sharing my screen? Yes, okay. Uh, can an accrual type that is earned once per calendar year be made so that it does not carry over to the next year? Actually, I do not believe we have that option. So. Um, it's a good idea. We that what we would do there is we would want to uh, let's see if I have a good system for Wakayakum. Um, we would want to hold on. Let me share my. Monitor one. There we go. Um, so what we'd we'd need to do is is create a, a checkbox or something in the either the accrual type or maybe in the accrual rules so that it could be for different for different people or maybe even in the employee accruals. It's really tricky with WinCams, right? So if we put it in the accrual rules or if we put it in the accrual types. Uh, so if we put it in the accrual types, then it would be, it would, it would apply to every 
every instance of this. So if you had a use it or lose it for comp time and we put a checkbox that says use it or lose it, then at year end, we could very easily uh, set, set the beginning balance to zero for everyone, regardless of how much comp time they had at year end, okay? Um, but that's for everyone's comp time. And if we put, do it there, then the, on, then the only way to have some people like managers or, or I don't know who, uh, allow them to continue to hold on to their comp time would be to create a different accrual type. So it'd be like comp time management and comp time non-management. Um, then the next level of detail is that we could do it here in the accrual rules so that when you have a bargaining unit, and then the floating, let's say for floating holiday, then we could say, um, you know, don't, don't, uh, or, or whatever, reset to zero each fiscal year. And um, that gives you more flexibility, but it also gives you more, it gives you more things, more boxes to check. So we have to find the sweet spot there where we say, okay, that does, do I want to allow people to have different bargaining units for the same accrual type, have different behavior, or do I want to have, you know, but, but then knowing that at the end, um, or, or that, that the implementation of that is that you have to go into every bargaining unit for that accrual type and set it to not roll over. But Darlene, I like the idea um, to uh, have use it or lose it accruals. I don't like use it or lose it accruals personally, but I like the idea that we, it doesn't sound very hard. So um, I've made a note and we'll, we'll look into it. Uh, number two, our accruals are all messed up. Can the current information be deleted and I can start over? So at first when I read this, I thought, I thought, okay, this is something I need to work on with Darlene. And actually, Darlene, remind me, I'm, I just set up a, in a, uh, uh, an accruals training uh, little one-on-one -on -one with a woman, Diane, from um, Grays Harbor County in Washington. So I'm going to send you that, that invite and maybe we can do... Um, that together, that's gonna be on Monday morning, the 31st. Um, okay, so your crews are all messed up. So at first I thought, no, I'll just contact Arlene personally and we'll see if she, um, you know, how to how to get her straightened out. And um, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe other people have this this question. So I'm not going to address Darlene's specific accrual situation. I don't know what she means by messed up. Can the current information be deleted and start over? Absolutely. We can do that with scripts. We can do that anytime. We can set you to all, set everybody to zero or just clear it all out if you want to re-add it. I'm I got enough questions about a leave accruals that I might want to do uh, maybe put that into the webinar schedule. Um, and how to set up leave accruals. We have a full featured leave accrual system. In just briefly, it goes for it goes, it starts with accrual types. Here's they, these people have set up comp time, floating holiday, sick leave, and annual leave. Um, then you attach the accrual types to the employees, right? So what are they eligible for? And you and and then you also attach the accrual types to the earn codes, okay? So the earn codes are what indicate that when you're using leave, that's that's how we know. So there's an accruals panel here on the earn code. So if you have, um, so here's comp time earned is E. So if you they use it at this at this county, Wakayakum County, they if they use an E on their um, on their time card, and then then that chain then that sets the associated accrual type is comp time, right? And so then we can start saying, okay, well, does that mean you're using it and reducing your, your balance or are you earning it and adding to your balance? And then we can have an eligible hours multiplier. So if it's if you put in E type hours of regular time, then we will add to comp time. And the reason I know what's adding is because we don't have this accrued leave used checkbox checked, okay? And so we, if you put in two hours of um, E type time on your time card, we will add one add one times that two hours to your comp time balance, 
And if you put it in as overtime, then we'll add 1.5. So you put in two hours and then you'll get three hours of comp time. Okay. Mostly in the time cards, we do usage, right? So then if you have floating holiday, F is your, the, in, in this case, you can use whatever you want, <clears throat> but F is their earn code for floating that's tied to associated with floating holiday. And the checkbox says, yes, it's, it means used. So then if you put an hour of F onto a time card, then we will put <clears throat> reduce the person's balance by by that exact number of hours. So um, where you're going to see this is in um, in the accruals tab <clears throat> of the <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> the um, the employee screen. So. Um, so any accrual type that this employee is eligible for needs to be listed here, okay? And when you add one, if you add an accrual type, then you it will ask you for a beginning balance, okay? So I'm going to delete annual leave real quick, Let's see if it'll let me. It's saying this accrual type has details associated with you. Are you sure you want to continue? It's Are you certain? Yes, I am triple check. Uh, this is not their data. This is my copy of their data. So if I add an accrual type here, um, let's see, I need a annual leave, right? Then it asks me for the beginning balance. Normally, I like to start with a zero, zero beginning balance. If you're starting with, a, if you if you have people that of course already have balances and you want to start out, then I might put in 30 hours here. But I also might like to enter a specific adjustment later. That's how many hours. So I'm going to start with zero. Okay. If I want to mess with that later, this button here allows me to update the beginning balance. Okay. So now I have zero beginning balance. Okay, and then if I want to enter an adjustment, that is under CAMS, Applied Charges, Employee Accruals Detail, and you can, and this is where we post to this. So if I use um, an hour of comp time or something like that in a, on a time card, we post to this and create those. Uh, so you can see here, um, here's some usage of sick leave right? 16 hours of sick leaves that posted from Charles Byers time card. Okay. But I can also enter records and I pick an employee and put it in a cruel, a cruel type, right? And then I, and then it defaults to adjustment. So then I can, and it will show me once I pick an employee, right? So who was my guy here? Terry. Okay. So I'm going to search for Terry. Okay, so I pick Terry, and then I pick uh, my annual leave, right? And as soon as I do that, it tells me what the current status is, right? So then if I wanted him to, I want to enter an adjustment of giving him 50 hours, I do that. Um, sorry, I'm in two, 2019, so the effective date is, how about 050119? Okay, so then his his ending balance goes up to 50. And you can see here his adjustments are 50, his ending balance is 50. Okay, so there's so so there are th three or four ways to to modify your leave. One is through the employee accruals detail. You don't want to do that normally, but if somebody that's how you would do maybe like um, if, every, if people are donating leave time to someone who's sick or has a, a catastrophe in their life or crisis, or if you just wanna, if your leave accruals are off and you just wanna adjust them to match up with your with your auditor system or 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 if, I don't know, some whatever, somebody has quit and then come back and they, they get, they get to, or they transferred from another department and they get, um, they can, they, you, agree to do, um, <clears throat> to set their, or they can transfer their leave, I don't know. So that's adjustments. Um, then usage will come from the time cards. So if your earn code is tied correctly to your to your uh, leave accrual type, then whenever you use an earn code, then in real time, it will adjust your pending used right there, okay? And then when you actually post, 
your time card, it will move that pending usage into the, the posted usage, right? And then the earnings, earnings can come from time cards, particularly with comp time, right? If I work some overtime, I can say I want to earn comp time. So that, that does happen. Um, but the earnings normally comes through the accrual rules, okay? So here is floating holiday for, and these are by bargaining unit. So this says, no matter how senior you are, at, at uh, once per calendar year, you get eight hours, okay? And you can set maximums and minimums and warnings and things like that. And, and uh, so let's see, let's, let's do like vacation. So here is, these guys are very simple. People on management annual leave, they get um, once per payroll period, they get eight hours. Okay. A lot of times you have multiple rows here that says your first, like here at, at CSS, your first five years you get 10 days a year. And then uh, after, and then you, once you get to five years, I think you get 15 days a year, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you'll want to make this uh, fit in with your, with your county rules. Okay. And I'm happy to set that up for you. And actually, uh, if, if maybe we'll make that into a real webinar next Monday, um, we're, uh, with, with, uh, Diane at Grays Harbor and maybe I'll, and if anybody else wants to learn about accruals, I'm happy to, I have some documents on it and, and we'll, maybe we'll record that webinar. Or you can participate in that webinar as well. Um, so it's pretty full featured. So if yours are off, there's no reason for them to be off. We just need to get them lined up. It can be a little bit tricky because what happens is you say, okay, I'm gonna get a report from my auditor that says Aaron has 20 hours of vacation. Okay, great. But Aaron's already entered his time and maybe things that affect vacation, you know, the auditor report is from two Fridays ago, you know, that kind of thing. Another place I've seen people get really messed up is this, this year range. We had this at um, Island County in Washington where, their documentation in their MOUs said something like through the third year. They literally use those words. And so if you say through the third year, what does that really mean? Well, to me, that means begin year zero and end year, uh, let's see, 2.99. And that was really hard for them to understand because your first year is zero to 0.99 or zero to one, if you wanna say that. Your second year is one to two, and your third year is two to 2.99. But they had it zero to, to 3.99. But zero to 3.99 is four full years, right? Or zero to four is four full years, right? I like to give people birthday cards, like on their 40th birthday or their 39th birthday, you say, you, you write in it, <clears throat> you know, have a great 40th year. And they say, oh no, I'm 39, but it is their 40th year that's starting, right? Because we all start at zero. Um, okay, so, um, and Darlene's question is also, um, is it better to do this at the beginning of the year? Um, doesn't matter, um, it is, it's, we can wait or, or not either way. Um, Darlene's last question is, <clears throat> in preparing for budgets, this has never been used, blah, blah, blah. Do, how do I enter our approved budget amounts for each account? Do I have to go through the steps, requested, approved, adopted, or will I be able to just enter the adopted budget? Great question, Darlene, thank you. Okay, so it's completely switching gears. Um, if we go into the budget ledgers, I'm just gonna be kind of cleaning up as I go, trying to keep me from having 50 windows open. Um, and making sure that yep, you can see it. Okay, so um, so here's a budget. Your your format may look different. Uh, this is again what Kayakum's um, budget format. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements. Um, yours may have three or two or four or six or whatever. So if you go to the appropriations tab, you'll notice here there's no budgeting, right? So this is fine. Um, but what this means, if you have no budget here, that means that we will post to expenditures from say invoices, journals normally um, in Washington, even from time cards and material usage, equipment usage, uh, and we'll post to encumbrances from encumbrance documents, POs, contracts, et cetera. But we will not know how much you're expecting to spend. So what that means is that your um, 
unexpended balance is going to go negative and your unencumbered balance is going to go negative and that's fine we don't actually care um, if you click on a um, budget in the in say an invoice right then it w it'll show up in yellow at the bottom meaning that it's underwater meaning you've overspent this budget and that's fine I'm, we're not complaining about it but if you want to put in appropriations it's very easy i'm about to do so so if i go to uh this budget here or i mean sorry this invoice here right so if i click on that in that okay this one this one actually is blue so it has money left so that's great okay so if I double click here, I can go to it. So they have a $14,000 budget. They've spent 1687 of posted money so far. So they have 12,312 um, left. So that's what I see in the budget, right? But if I go to, um, oh, well, so they've really, okay, here we go. This is what I'm talking about. So this one is yellow because it's underwater now they did put in a budget but they overspent it by 517 dollars so that's fine okay so i'm going to go back to that one that was blank and i'm going to go to the appropriations tab okay and we normally put this in for you this is what allows us to have um, this year here if you want multiple years you can put in multiple appropriations and it will create like a 2018 2020 2021 whatever that's only if you need to um, put in an invoice and or a purchase order that that references that year so i'm going to go to appropriations you can just i'll delete this record real quick you can put that in i'm going to say since we're working in two, year 2019 i'm going to go 0101 19 not 14 okay and i'm going to say uh adopted appropriation is the one i want okay and i'm going to say one thousand dollars i might have a comment like a resolution number or something like that i might link a file that whatever i want to do right so so that there's no need to post there's no further things you need to do you don't need to go through this whole each step of this you can just put in the adopted appropriation original and then it will show up as 1000 here and then when you reference this budget on an invoice um, i'm going to copy this invoice okay so i made a copy of, the, of an invoice just so i can get one in there and then i'm going to look up uh, my budget, which I think was the first one, drill all the way in there. Um, so you can see that it comes up with that budget name and one thousand dollars, right? And then if I save it, it goes down to nine forty six fifty because I just saved a line referencing that budget, that line item for fifty three fifty. So a lot of people don't put in appropriations because they say, well, that's not, that's the auditor's job or whatever, but I think it's super easy and it gives you a nice, um, you know, feedback. So if I was to accidentally type in, um, I don't know, 5350, right? Instead of, so, so I did that, then, well, first of all, I'm out of balance with my invoice, but if I go here, I'm, it's a, it's yellow in the bar saying I'm underwater by four thousand three hundred fifty dollars. So that's good feedback for me to know that I'm that I'm not there. And I can see that I have a pending balance here of four of negative forty three fifty and pending expenditures of fifty three fifty. And I can see that here in the budget expenditure ledger as well. There's my invoice test. Okay. And then one, if I post it, then that's fine. That the pending will go down to zero, and I will put. $5,350 there, and then my unexpended balance will be in the negative again. So you do not need to uh, go through all the steps of each of these. Now, you can, if you, so a lot of people want to, so this is the, this is the one, adopted appropriation original is the one that gets it into the actual budget, right? It's the one that fills this value in, okay? The other ones are if you want to go through these steps, budget requested, budget approved right we got to get 
budget adopted, we got to get it to a, so if you want to keep track of each step of the way, be my guest, but what you want to get to is adopted appropriation original. Now, if then they come back and say, you know what, we ran out of money and we need to put in more, then we can do adopted appropriation adjustment and we can do say another $250 and I should see 1250 now. And now I have the, the, the history of what happened, how I got to 1250, right? I could have also just typed over this and said 1250, that's fine. But uh, this is nice because I, I have the history. Maybe I put in a comment about why or who requested it or a resolution number or something like that. Um, and uh, the only other thing to remember, let's see. I believe that budget adopted will trans, don't quote me on this, but I believe the budget adopted, if you put that in, in, in this year, then when you transfer to the new year, it will become your adopted appropriation in the new year. So the year end will do that. Okay. Patrick from Tulare. So we're going to be switching gears really fast here. I apologize if it's, if you know, put it in the chat if you don't understand something or something doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, so now we're going to... Uh, Utilities AR, posting, and post-credit balances. How does post-credit balances work? How does WinCams know when a receipt is overpaid and when to allocate a credit to unpaid charges? Okay, great question. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so, um, this, this client does not have utilities. So actually, I'm gonna leave them up. And so I'm going to run Patrick's system. Tulare County RMA. Okay, so what Patrick's talking about is in utilities AR, and actually this applies in, so in all of WinCam's AR, we are what I would call uh, document-based AR. So there's, there are two types of AR in this format that, that, that I, in my, my world, right? So if you have um, an account or a tab at the bar, right? They, does anybody still have tabs at the bar? Um, they, so you go in and you have a beer and they say, okay, it's uh, $5. And then you go in and have another beer and it's now you got $10. Well, then when you want to settle up, they don't ask you to pay for the for the, the beer you had yesterday and the beer you had today. They just say you owe $10 and you pay against that $10, okay? So that's more of a, of a I don't know what to call that, but that's just a account balance type of AR, okay? Now, WinCams, is more document oriented. And so what we want to do generally is we want to link up any payments to transactions. Okay? So if you ha so and this is true in each of our AR modules. We have accounts receivable, that's general AR, we have solid waste AR that's for landfills, etc. and we have utilities AR that's for water and sewer billing, electric billing, whatever else you want and they they all work pretty much the same way but they have different you know obviously utilities has um, features that are related to energy consumption water consumption um, and has tiered rates and all that stuff uh, accounts receivable receivable is more generic for marinas um, airport hangar rentals any permit charges uh, just you know, that's where our project reimbursable billing goes to, that's where our vehicle reimbursables go to. And then solid waste, of course, has information about delivery tickets and weights and things like that. Okay, so what we wanna do is we're trying to link up each charge to a corresponding payment, or I should have said that in reverse, each payment to a, to a charge. So when you put in a payment, we're expecting to, um, to link them up, right? So what, which is great. So when you, if you've got some charges, let's see, do we have anybody with charges here? Um, what's going on here? Come on, there we go. 
Okay, so okay, transaction. All right, so maybe Rick Davis. Ha okay, Rick Davis has a balance of ninety six seventy five. Okay, so um, so I, if I go in and let's say I get a check from Rick Davis. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I go in either to cash receipts or I go into, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm processing a higher volume, I can put it into cash receipts. I'm going to put it directly into utility payments. Okay. So <clears throat> I um, <clears throat> put in a um, a receipt. Uh, they don't have automatic numbering. If you want automatic numbering, let me know and we'll turn that on. Um, and I'm going to go pick a client. I'm going to search for Rick Davis. Hopefully that's the right Rick Davis. Uh, okay. So now um, let's just say that he pays. Um, Three hundred dollars. Okay. Now I go in here to the detail, and what WinCams wants us to do is to um, is to link up that three hundred dollars with his outstanding charges. So if you're in regular AR, this is going to be an invoice number that we're going to look to to tie the payment to, or or multiple invoice numbers. If you are, and we have. In regular AR, we have some automate, automated buttons that say, you know, just apply it to to their invoices in order. Um, this version doesn't have that, but it looks similar. So when I look up a transaction control number, it says here's two unpaid invoices. Remember, he had $96.75 owed, right? So then I have the same things. We just don't have the buttons exposed here. Um, but I have import oldest charges or I can select rows, right? specific rows so let's some people have like 10 different charges there and i can select the specific rows that i want to that i want to pay if you have rules or whatever okay so what i'm going to just do is say import oldest charges okay so what it should do is it brings in the two lines right and of course it only brings them in to um to the amount that they are right so 96.75 and you can see here this is yellow and because I because he paid three hundred dollars, so um, in regular AR you have the sim you have actually two options. You can bring in the charges with their full amounts, and then you can manipulate the amounts, or you can bring in the charges up from oldest first up to the the amount you put in. Because many times people pay less than their full amount or whatever, right? But what what Patrick's question was was about overpayments. Okay, so now. I've got an imbalance. I go in there. I'm like, huh. So maybe at this point, I look again at Patrick's check, make sure I got $300 right. May, I'm sorry, not Patrick's. Uh, Rick Davis's check. Now and maybe I now I, maybe I. Some places have different rules. Now, some places don't accept that. Some places have to return the extra amount. Whatever. What if you're allowed to do it? What you can do is create another line that does not reference a transaction control number for the remaining amount. Right. And so that is two hundred three dollars and twenty five cents, I believe. OK, so now the yellow goes away. And so I have I'm paying off two transactions and then I have one one. I want to, I'm going to keep that two oh three, but it's it's a, either a prepayment. Right. So if somebody has a, a monthly rental of something, maybe they pay a year in advance, but they don't even have the bills yet. To, to apply them to, okay? So he, now his client, if I post this, his client number is going to show a that he's got everything paid off and he's got a $203 credit, right? So then when charges come in later, this is what Patrick's asking about. So when charges come in later, then you can enter the charges and now everything's right as far as the client, right? Let's say he gets a $100 charge. Well, then if you look at and you post that, what now the client has a $103 credit and everything's good. The trouble is that that charge for $100 never gets marked paid. 
So that's the problem with an overpayment or a prepayment in a document-based AR system. Okay, so the solution to that is under posting, you go into, in Patrick's case, utilities AR, and you say post credit balances. And this will look for any unpaid invoices where the where there are also payments that don't link up with an invoice or don't link up with a charge. Okay, so in utilities, it's called post credit balances. In um, solid waste, it's called post solid waste credit balances. And in regular AR, it's called, it's very wordy, allocate overpayments to unpaid invoices. So Patrick's question was, how does WinCams know when a receipt is overpaid? Well, that's exactly how it knows, right? So because I, you have to put it in. You have to enter the receipt as in, you know, with more money than 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 is than there are charges available to soak it up, right? And so then that posting, once this was posted, that post credit balances would say, oh, there's a 203 credit balance out here. I'm going to try to find unpaid charges, and if it finds one, now oftentimes it'll find an exactly 203 because things just crossed in the mail. So maybe it finds an exactly 203 charge. Then what it'll do is it will put that transaction control number right into here and make it look like things came in in order. So it's pretty slick. Now it gets even more interesting if the charge, as I said, was $100, because then what it will do is also pretty cool. It will add a, a fourth line here and it will change this amount to $100, link it up to pay off that other charge and then make a fourth line for the remainder. So then you have a fourth line that is 103, 25, which is the leftover. So no change to the um, client balance, but it, but then we say, okay, these three lines. So that so what can happen? Um, the simplest example is a prepayment. You you owe us $100 a month. Okay, I don't want to deal with it. I'm going to send you a check for $1,200. If your organization allows it and you can keep it, you can put in a payment for $1,200, and then each month as that hopefully you're using payment plans or something like that, but each month as those invoices are created and part of your monthly AR process is you run post credit balances or allocate over payments, it will take that $1,200 and make two lines, right? So the first line will say $100 paying off this new invoice, and then there's an unallocated $1,100 line. And then the second month, it'll be another, it'll create another line for $100 paying off the second invoice, and now we have $1,000 left that's unallocated. Okay, um, thanks for your question. Set default directory setting on RO printing. Uh, this is from Natalie Ann at Chelan County um, in uh, Wenatchee, Washington. And so she says, I don't quite understand, set default directory setting on RO printing so that each user can customize their setting and have it change, not, and, not have to change it each time. Okay, I'm not quite sure with the terminology she's using whether she's talking about directories or printing, uh, or or actually literally printing. So um, can I clarify? Can you hear me? It's Natalie Ann. Hi. It's sure. me. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm talking about the print settings. Okay. Um, when you open up, when you go to print an RO. Okay. And just in brief, a couple of our shop managers, I think there were some changes made to this program within the last few months. And so what was set as a default print setting is now different. And we've just had some issues trying to get it back to that and staying at what they want it to, to print as. If that makes okay. sense. Great. Thanks. Um, well, maybe I, I, I don't know, maybe you can unmute yourself. I don't really want to unmute every, everybody. Okay, you did. Okay, so if anybody wants to talk to yeah. me or, or like tell, go ahead and do so. I'm not saying you can't talk to me, but um, I don't, you know, you're probably half of you are at home or whatever. Um, okay, so uh, Chelan County, beautiful Natchez, Washington. Um, so I think she was talking about ROs. So I'm going to go to ROs. So basically this works on any um, report. It's most useful on on um on forms because forms have like a physical location component like i need to hand it to somebody whereas a lot of reports they may not ever make it onto paper they may just go to um to a pdf or something or or excel um so 
what Natalie Ann's saying, I think, is that that the her shop people, when they print their repair order forms, they don't want to print, uh, you know, in the office or you know maybe they have a whole list of uh, they want to print a different place than where they print maybe a a, a, a a maintenance scheduling report or something like that. Okay, so what you do is on any um, so if I go ahead and say print repair orders, make sure I've got accept user input and preview. Okay, so I'm gonna. I just go to this repair order to install floor mats, and um, it brings up the form printing screen. Okay, so what is where? What what's important here is um, this button right here, and you'll see this in any report, uh, any WinCams report. Okay, so if you go in here, this is where you can say I want to choose my my uh, my printer. Okay, so these are the printers I have plus some of our old printers, right? So you can, so let's say I want this to go to my... Um... Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Sure. So I should have clarified, not necessarily the print setup. I meant to say the report order, those settings. Is there a way to default that so that every time you get into the report order, anything that was checked with the prior RO stays the same for this new RO? That's a whole uh, different question than where you were going. <laughs> uh, I, do you, because, you, mean, the, me do you say, mean the headings right here? I mean the order, do you print, you're, you, I mean the, you the mean the order in which they come out? More specifically. No, 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 just boxes? see how there's a bunch of boxes checked under the yeah, section menu? They should, they should remember should, um, for each. Uh, should, that, should that stay the same? Yeah, that should stay the same. Um, for okay. for a given user, um, I can have uh, I can have somebody look into um, that making sure that works. Um, but yeah, these these check boxes should stay the same. The other thing you can do is use a template, right? And say yeah. you know set, check all the boxes you want, and then say save settings to file. And then when you come into the the other the come into it again, do load settings from file. But these should come back so uh, there may be some I'm is not there sure. like the parts detail checkbox yeah is that contingent on whether or not whatever is under the parts tab is posted or pending in other words yes. if that's parts, checked which well, it okay. always is when you there is no if it's pending it's not under the parts tab right it's under so we right, cannot print right. pending stuff however we if it okay. shows up here then yes it will it it can print okay, okay. i think that answers print the question and now we have some recent uh a recent pretty cool change where where um parts that you use like if you put in you either you can enter them here and they will they are automatically drawing down your inventory or you can enter them in inventory issues or and they will automatically show up here so but if they're in here then um, so then they will um, they will print but I also think it's useful to what I was what I was mistakenly going to um, so I'll look into making sure those settings are set for you, Natalie, and or are uh, saved. So if you go into print setup, okay. and let's say I pick a different printer, like a color LaserJet Pro, and I say OK, and then I say this report only, I will get this message. And this message is kind of cool. Always use this printer for this report. So that means um, that means tells WinCams to remember that for repair order forms, um, right? Uh, Oops, I'm doing it actually on the repair order. Sorry. If I do for repair order forms, um, if I go in here and I pick my color laser jet and I say okay, and then for repair order forms, I if I say yes, it will say I know your default printer is your normal laser jet, but but you want your forms to be printed in color, so I so I hit yes, and now for me only, every time I go into repair order forms, it will print from that printer. And so we, that's where we have an office staff maybe, and they print reports and stuff to their their local printer or whatever. But then when they we get a call about a service request or something like that, and they want to print a form, maybe they want it to print on the printer in the in the maintenance guy's uh, you know office or something like that. And so then we can kind of that way remember multiple printers for specific operations. So that's kind of cool. Um, okay. Uh, 
I got to get moving here. In Natalie Ann says, in time cards, can we lock the date when entering new time entries for a certain group of employees? So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by lock the date, but um, what you're going to be, what our locking features are, are based on the status of the time card or another way to lock that I encourage people to use if they want is to go into your payroll periods okay and right here it says time card entry so it defaults to all users that means anybody can enter time in this period right so let's get to our current period okay so here's uh 8 1 to 8 31 right so right now i would this isn't her live data but right now i would want all users to be able to enter their time in 8 1 to 8 31 but if i go to september i don't want all anybody to be able to enter it so i can say no time card entry allowed period that means natalie ann can't enter that means i can't enter you're just everybody's locked so if somebody tries to like pre-enter september stuff or they accidentally type september stuff we will not allow it period and so what so if you want to use this feature what we want what i would think you want to do is set all of your periods to no time card entry allowed and then like maybe the day before or the or maybe on the first or or the first day of the period you you switch it to all users and you say okay time cards are open now you can you can start creating your time cards right and then once the cutoff comes you can there's a middle ground where you say timekeepers only and then we don't then you can't have employees doing it supervisors can't can't mess with time cards we're now in the auditing process and we're expecting to um you know so so that's pretty heavy-handed but if you want to use that you can and then the other way would be um going into this is, is by utilizing the statuses of the time cards And I went over this in webinar number two or three or something. But as you move, if you set up these statuses correctly, then when the employee submits it, or they can submit just a week, right? Um, or they can submit a certain date range. It will then lock the um, the it will then lock the time card to that employee. But of course, that only works if you have you know some places they say well i tried doing that and everybody can update their time card even after they submit and then we find out that it's because they made everybody a, a, an, an admin or something like that so uh so if you need help i would watch that that webinar or contact me and make sure you know how to set up branch supervisors and things like that and if you want to move these through these and we actually can go they uh chelan county is only using employee submit and branch supervisor submit we also have direct supervisor approvals and uh, branch group supervisor approvals if you want so we have up to four levels of approvals okay and that will I'll elaborate on my question you want to moderate sure what's <laughs> what did i get it well wrong? the question the question was related to actual time entry in time cards so like our foremen when they enter their time for their crew they only have five or six guys time to enter and they want to be able to instead of changing the date or having the date change every time they go to create a new entry for a new employee to do one entry set the date to 8 24 say it's yesterday's oh, time okay. and then every time they go to the next employee that date stays the same okay so you lot you're saying literally lock you're not saying lock a date you're saying lock not necessarily date, lock it lock the date correct field cell yeah. um yeah that during is, time entry so i would yeah. call that I would use the term um, default, you know, so we do that okay. like if you're entering invoices and you put in a batch number, then when you hit plus, yeah. it will put that same batch number in because we're assuming that you want to do an, another one in that batch. So you're saying right. enter a time card for a certain date and then um, and then and then when you hit plus, put that same bit date back. Is that the idea? Remember the same date. Yeah, because I think what it does right now, if it defaults at all, I can't remember, it will default to today's date. And yes. But most of the time, the 
you know, they want to enter two weeks time. I think maybe we should have yesterday or... which, whether you want to lock which one, of, which one of these, because you might, because the, as soon as I do that, so here it will default to today, you're right. As soon as I, so if I put a checkbox here that says, you know, lock this value, then, yeah. then the, the next person will say, or I'm, I'm sorry, if I did that, that behind the scenes, the next person will say, well, no, I don't enter them like that. I enter for the same employee for multiple dates, right? And so, right. so then I, it'd be cool. So I think we had a checkbox on each one of them, so you could lock either one as you move forward, right? Um, yeah. yeah, just something okay. like that, I just made, so they less things of, enter. Great, I made a note. Thank you. Uh, how can I run a placement bank report that lets me sort by revenue type? Can a break or criteria be added to specify another level of detail? Um, yes. So replacement banks are something that we we developed with in partnership with Walla Walla County um, in also in Washington, and they are basically um, banks um, of uh, so where where we can so you can track a bunch of revenue to a group of vehicles, right? So we can put, you can add a bunch of vehicles to this bank. And then so so they've got all these vehicles and then their revenues come in here or they get shown. They don't come in there. They just they they so then you can s sort of get a status here that says um, uh, and you can run a report and then you can manually enter expenditures. So you can say, OK, we've received revenues for for this group of vehicles, uh, you know, for replacement of fifty thousand dollars. And then we're going to enter an expenditure against that fifty thousand dollars so that you know so we so that because it doesn't apparently as the guy who suggested it to me said it, it doesn't really work that a single vehicle gathers up all its replacement value and then and then you need to create an and then you uh you create another one so i think natalie Ann is asking is to add revenue type to the replacement report pr presumably because she doesn't want O and M revenue to to play a role. She wants like only replacement revenue to to play a role to find out what she's how much she has in that bank. That's my theory. Okay. Um, you are correct. <laughs> so what I will do is I will add uh, revenue type to. Will it be a selection criteria or a break? It'd be a it'd be um, a criteria, right? It would normally be both, but I think what you want is selection okay. criteria. Normally, what okay. I, yeah. if it makes sense, I try to add, I tell the guys to add it as a, a selection criteria, a control break, and an optional column. So that you I was going to say a column would work too. Yeah. Right. But you, I think what you want is you say, I want to see how much is in the motor pool revenue bank, but I only, but I don't yeah. want this line and I don't want that line. I only want that line. Right. Correct. Yep. Okay. We'll and do. to be able to total from months prior or whatever. Yep. Okay. Um, Natalie Ann says, if prior meter type is both, how do we define whether the reported usage when fuel is added is either mileage or hour data? Um, that's a really good question. Boy, Natalie Ann. Uh, I know. I'm just, right now they're coming in as, um, they all come in just under meter. Right. And so, the hour um, type is so what, usually blank. What Natalie's Ann is talking about is, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. So in your vehicle master, you have a primary meter type and that can be odometer or miles or hours or both, right? And when you set it to both, as Natalie Ann's talking about, she, you get, um, you'll get your operational tab will change and it will show, uh, it'll get two panels. So let's see here, operational. I can give you an equipment so, number that so will have So this one both. has miles, right, uh, only, right? And then, and so if I, because it says miles right there, and if I go to, if I change it to both, then what should happen is, if it'll, what's going on? Come on, save. There we go. Um, what should happen is that the operational tab will now have a meter, an, an odometer area and an hour meter area. Okay. 
and so in here we keep track of meters versus hour meters but what she's asking about is in fuel so in fuel data entry so there's an hours odom field that is separate from the odometer and so um so you if you enter it here then it's the mileage odometer here it's the hours odometer if you only have one or the other we really don't care to be honest if you only have if you if you if you set that setting in the vehicle master to hours or miles over here oh, come on there we go uh, if you set this to hours or miles, it really doesn't make any difference to us. The only change that means for us is that we uh, is is that if you're in hours, then we do um, we have different thresholds for warning you about too high of of you know too high a reading. Um, but so I think what we need to do with with you, Natalie Ann, is it, so this is how you do it in fuel data entry. But we there's a set if we need to know which field is coming in in your fuel card lock um, correct so that would be a something to figure out from our fuel system right. as well or, or then, we right? could do it based on based on the setting well no we can't because if it's if you have both then we don't know right um, yeah so that's so, going to take some so manual you're need operation to look at your card lock file and and know whether and, and have different fields for miles versus hours okay okay thank um, you sure uh last question from natalie ann right click copy option to paste data down to other detail lines so um you should have that in most uh okay so if i go here uh no let's go let's go back to my invoice did i still have my invoice there's a button for it but can you actually just right click with your over the line instead of having to use the button that's where um, I was going with I that. Think right, I think it's a right click. Okay. So I'm going to open an invoice and I'll try to find one with or that has a lot of detail lines. So what this this feature and maybe I'm again barking up the wrong tree but um what this feature so somebody said to me oh, i entered a time card and it's got 12 lines or I entered an invoice and it's got six lines okay every every invoice has one line two lines come on there we go okay so i entered this invoice and i realize now i'm gonna make a copy of it so i can play with it Okay, so I entered this invoice and I realize now that I put the wrong budget onto these lines. So I go and I, and I and I go and I and they call me and they say I don't want to have to pick uh, a different budget, right, on every one. So I go in and I and so I do have to I have to of course pick it on one. Um, okay, so I pick it on one and I save it. Um, let me make sure you know, I'm getting into some, okay, so let's just clear this so that I can show you what I'm trying to do here, parts, get these off here, okay. Um, so I've picked, I've changed my budget on the one line. Now, if I right click, I have got copy budget expenditure account to the other detail lines. Okay. So, so I've got this one with 34, 34 and 31, but what I really want is this. And I don't want to go back to each line and do it. So no matter how many lines there are, I can right click, copy that budget. It confirms and I'm, and now, now they all match. I should be able to do this on uh, any of them. Okay. I, I, I misspelled something into the, the description or I just forgot to put a description in. Um, copy description to other detail lines. There you go. Does this work in other programs as well? It should. Uh, like shop inventory issues or 
inventory uh, master. See. Not in this one. Um, you could send me an email if there's, you try it in, it should, okay. I mean, we, we definitely implemented it in some of our main ones. I don't know if it's in shop inventory issues, but it shouldn't be hard to add. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Sure. Sue from Deschutes County Solid Waste. I was just in Deschutes County a few days ago, um, backpacking and um, in Central Oregon. Uh, emailing statements. So we do have emailing functionality in several areas um, in uh, assigning service requests, um, uh, vehicle maintenance scheduling, we can email. Um, there's several areas where we can can create an email. We do need to set it up with you. Um, we've never gone to the level of emailing statements, but we're getting very close to it. Um, the problem isn't the emailing. We can set that up for you pretty easily. The pro the issue is normally printing directly to a PDF and then attaching that PDF to the email and then emailing it out, right? And not doing them one at a time. So you what you probably want to do is you want to you want to basically do a hundred PDFs, um, separate files, and then attach each of them to the correct email to that person. So um, we'd have to we so we we can do all those things, and we are um, we are very close to printing directly to PDF. You can always choose a printer that says you know like your PDF writer printer if you have one when you're printing. Um, and we'll print directly to PDF. But what we don't do is, you know, create. If you if you want to print statements for 50 clients, we don't create 50 different PDFs, right? Unless you do it 50 different times, choosing different clients. So we are working on that, and in particular, we're working on that with um, payment processors. So we have a couple clients that process a lot of payments, and we don't do point of sale stuff um, with credit cards or anything. So we are working with uh, point and pay. And they um, and they do that kind of thing too. So basically, we send them uh, a a file of saying Aaron owes this much money, and then I have the option to go. On, Aaron, the client, has an option to go onto the website, pay with a credit card, see how much they owe, etc. Then Point and Pay sends us back a file that says, Hey, Aaron paid, and then we automatically create your cash receipts for you or your payments. Um, so it's pretty slick. Um, they also, any payment processor, you don't have to use point and pay, but any payment processor will also have the ability to um, have us send them PDFs or uh, or whatever, and they can either print, do all your mailing for you and your envelopes and your stamp licking, or they can actually um, just do that emailing for you right and manage it all for you and they and encourage people to use their online payment processing and i don't know what they charge you know a few pennies or something per per um per mailing or per uh per payment process but one really cool thing is that in all, all of them that i've talked to their business model is basically no cost to the county um so what they do is they say you know when if you you send them your your um information and then when people go to pay online with them, they have a convenience fee. And so say they pay $2 convenience fee, then point and pay takes their cut out of, out of or that's where they get their money and they don't charge uh, you any money at all. So my, you know, we, we tell me the, which, which way you want to go. We can, we can, there's two, two avenues here. One is to, um, set it up so we can print multiple PDFs and attach them, work, work on it, you know, this would be a change order for us where we would attach them to emails. And of course, we'd have to make sure that we know who to email and blah, 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 and the format of the email. But we already do all those things. We just need to put it all together. Or we, if you want to discuss working with a payment processor and just have them deal with it. Some people do that just because they don't want to stuff envelopes anymore. So um, let me know. Uh, next question from Sue at Deschutes Solid Waste, test environment. So a lot of our clients have a test environment. Um, there are basically three flavors of a test environment. Um, there are three important things that you want to think about in a test environment. Um, one is the programs themselves, 
So some people, their test environment is saying, when I install a patch, I want to install it first on the test environment and leave the programs in the live environment alone and maybe do some testing. The second is the database. Um, so they want a copy of the database in their test environment. And that is more aimed at, um, I want to play around with project reimbursable billing and I don't want to mess with my live data. So I want a copy of my, so I'll use the same programs perhaps, um, and, but I just want a copy of my live data so that I can run a billing or run a posting and, and not get stuck and, and play around or enter nonsense data or whatever. And then the third item is the configuration. So if you have a completely separate instance, then you have configuration, database, and programs, or you can have a mixture of those things. So it's not hard to set up. Um, in it's not part of our maintenance agreement. Um, so, but you know, we'll we'll guide you to what needs to be done or help with your IT. So, if you want a test database, I can go over those options with you. The simplest thing to do is just have your IT copy, say, your 2020 or 2021 year to a completely different year, like uh, 2042 or something like that, something that no one would get confused by, and then you just have a database you can mess around with. Um, now, if you're saying, no, I want to I want to test a patch before it comes in, I want to be able to install it in the, um, in the, uh, or I want to, before I, I want to install it in the test environment and not in the live environment, then that's a different story, and, and I can explain to you how to do that as well. Um, we're also willing to kind of take on the test environment as, as with an enhanced maintenance agreement or an ISM agreement, uh, which is where we install patches and we, we kind of, commit to doing more um, more handholding with IT for you, more server management, more more backup help, all that stuff. So um, that is, uh, so that's an enhanced maintenance agreement, an add-on to your maintenance agreement, we call an ISM. Um, but so where, what I, I guess what I, the reason I mentioned the maintenance agreement is because sometimes we have people with a test environment and they, and then they call me and they say, oh, our test environment isn't working. And there's a, limited amount of time I want my staff to spend troubleshooting a test environment, right? Um, it, you know, it, we want to, what we'd like to do is give some instructions to your IT and then have them be able to update it. And so the people that are doing it well, they do it great. And they just say, Hey, IT, can you, can you get, can you like refresh our test environment? And they know that that means refreshing the programs, refreshing the database and refreshing the configuration file. And then they can have a, you know, a sandbox to play in. Um, so contact me if you want to uh, set that up. Um, another question from Sue, allocations by GL line or project, admin costs, allocate overhead based on various methodologies via clearing counts. Okay, so that's a big question. Um, allocating overhead, well, so these allocations by GL line or project, you can certainly do that with a, um, with a journal. If you say, okay, I've got, um, I've got a total amount of overhead and then I want to break it down. I've run a report of the amount I spent on each of these areas and then I'm going to, and then I've put my overhead into my, my spreadsheet and then it's proportionally given me amounts. Well, then you could load that into a journal and charge overhead. That's kind of a manual way of charging overhead. Um, the traditional way of charging overhead in WinCams is through labor. Okay. So if I go, and this is the standard way of doing it in a California county, okay? So overhead, and the reason we do it through labor is because that's, a, that's considered the best way to spread or, or apportion the, the overhead. So if, if I've, so if I've got guys working on Tulare County, well, there's overhead of our rent and our lights and our computers and maybe even me are overhead. You know, maybe WinCams is overhead in your environment. So your WinCams maintenance charges are considered overhead and you compare that to the total amount of your labor and you get an overhead amount, okay? Or an overhead percentage, sorry. And so, and, and I wanna clarify that this is different than fringe and non-productive. Fringe and non-productive are normally set by employee, right, for how much fringe and non-productive they get. Um, but overhead is normally, let's see here, I don't have overhead showing overhead. 
But overhead, okay, this county, there's some. Okay, so here is uh, MG number two, this division, design, development, and construction, signal maintenance. So anyone working in signal maintenance has an overhead well, as of March 1st, they had an overhead of 80%. On March 29th, they went, their variance, they decided their variance was too high, so they increased their overhead. I have no comment on whether that's okay to increase on March 29th, but that's how you do it. So what ends up happening is any labor charge, any weighted labor rate that has, that, that use, references this activity code will get an overhead amount on it right, of 95%. So then when you post to a project or a road or or anything, we will post $100 worth of labor and $95 worth of overhead. And if you are a California county that uses cost centers, we'll post $100 of labor to there, there and clear it to the labor clearing account. And we'll post the $95 of overhead to there and clear it to the overhead clearing account. Okay. And it's a really slick way of doing things because then, you know, if I have overhead and let's say I run a mechanic shop and I have uh, the heating and the small tools and the miscellaneous lubricants and coveralls and the swamp cooler and new roof or whatever I'm doing on my in my shop anything that I anything that gets to the point where I don't I can't allocate it to a specific job then I throw that into my overhead and I calculate a percentage and then every person a percentage as as relates to labor, and then every person that works on a car, they will just carry this burden of overhead with them, right? And so then they've got their applied labor rate, and then we throw the overhead, and then if I work on three different cars, it gets spread evenly. If another car never comes into the shop, it doesn't get any overhead. So that's that's kind of the, the methodology I prefer. Um, and I'm happy to go into further detail of, of that with you. Um, Allocating direct costs, uh, Sue just asked. So direct costs would be you would you would allocate them directly, right? A a, a direct cost would would be um, so you would put that into an overhead area. You would you would you would say okay. So if you've got a well, okay, I, I'm sorry. If you allocate a direct cost and it's a direct cost to something, if you're using the word direct cost to mean this is a direct cost, like I had to go buy something for that particular landfill, like a, like a, like a, or I had to get it painted or, or for that particular truck or something like that, well, then it's a direct cost. And so you put in an invoice or a journal and you reference that specific thing. And I think, Sue, in your case, your landfills are projects. I believe so you would put a project onto the invoice where you paid the direct cost if it's if you are buying like a bunch of supplies or paying a bill that is that is uh versus calculating and charging individual ap detail lines so okay so what what i think you're saying here is you want to allocate a way you you want to buy something or pay a bill and then you want to spread it across a bunch of different things okay so one way to do that would be to put that into an overhead bin or a cost center or an overhead budget and then compare that you know and then say okay so our total labor was a million dollars and our total overhead area was eight hundred thousand dollars so we're going to have eighty percent overhead next year that's a very standard way of doing cost accounting or if you want to literally apply it to each of your 12 projects or each of whatever then what i would do is i would go into your invoices i would do it once i would pay this bill and apply it to all the individual detail you have to do it once because i can't do it for you um, and then you would use a distribution code okay and so i'm going to take this invoice right that has all this whatever these budgets are and this break and even this percentage breakdown which you've decided on and i use this button here create distribution code from invoice okay so i create a distribution code from the first time i use that invoice okay and now if i want to go see that distribution code it is right there in in uh, direct charges and by the way this also works in journals Okay, 
So what the heck? Uh, okay, I've got too many. Um, okay, my invoices are in Chelan, so I need to find Chelan. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So what I did there was I, I created the distribution code in there we go in Chelan, and then I and then I went to the distribution codes program in Tulare. Uh, there's distribution codes. So now what it created was the details of that line. Oh, cool, they already have some, neat. So here's mine, okay, here's my test. So it created four lines. Uh, remember, I, I put the same budget code on all of them, but whatever was there, this could be four different vehicles, 40 different vehicles, or a pair order, whatever, whatever's there. And you'll notice that it took away the amounts and instead put percentages. Okay, so now when I go and do a, a new invoice, um, um, it's warning me there's a duplicate invoice number, I know, and I put in $1,000 on the main tab, then I go to the detail line, and there's a button right next to that that says select distribution code. And I go in here and I find my test distribution. Okay. And then it has options to set the quantity for each line to one or set the quantity to a percent. So some people, if they bought a thousand widgets, they want <clears throat> they want the actual quantity to be broken down by the percentage as well. So I'm just going to set the quantity to one. Boom. I've got four. Um, invoice or four detail lines with the correct budget accounts. Again, I, I in our previous question, I, I made these all the same, but now it's, it's broken down by percent. So this is great for utility bills that get broken down by a whole bunch of districts or buildings or I don't know what you know and anything um, and and then but have a changing amount. If the if the amount's the same, then then making it a recurring invoice or copying it works great. The other thing that's nice about distribution codes, it, besides the the um, calculation, is that it persists from year to year. So if you are used to copying an invoice, that doesn't persist from year to year. So if you want, you'll you'll want to do that through a, dist, a distribution code or through making the invoice a recurring invoice uh, on the references tab. Okay, and um, so that can be done in journals or um, invoices, or I think AR invoices as well. Um, you'll so I notice I don't usually find this, but here is basically exactly what you're talking about. Sue is um, so here is ER and R vehicle overhead charges. So um, so they they basically listed out all their vehicles here and gave them each. 0.7874% of the overhead. So then when they figure out what their overhead is, they can put in a journal for $100,000 worth of overhead, and then they can pull in this, uh, this distribution code, and it will spread it across all these vehicles automatically. Um, reporting. I think these might get a little deep, uh, Sue. I'd rather work on this with you individually. Um, if you want to do a balance sheet, that's that's in our GL module, um, and I can help you set that up. I don't even actually know if you have our GL module, etc. But I think this might be a little deep for this discussion, so contact me. Um, Charlie at Butte County in Oroville, California. Uh, when can we use Windows AD credentials to authenticate into CAMS? We we are using it at Mendocino County. Um, we can work on setting that up for you. You, you what, one thing to realize is that all that gets you is a unified password and unified uh, credential. You still need Windows Windows Active Directory is still not going to understand our modules or our our security levels or any of that stuff. So you'd still have to set it up, but it would allow you to um, block someone from a, you know, you block them from Active Directory and then they're blocked out of CAMS or allow you to change their password in Active Directory and it doesn't matter what their password is in CAMS. So we 
we do have some of that that uh, implemented um, and we know how to do it. Um, password restrictions, we do have uh, some password restriction stuff um, that we can turn on. Um, if I go into security and users, Uh, it doesn't look like they're turned on, but we now have expiration dates and we have uh, some things that we can turn on for you that um, will enforce some of that stuff that we all hate, uh, like uh, it needs to be a certain number of digits or a certain number uh, special characters, I think. We have some stuff like that that um, that will that will enforce that. We also have the ability to set locks for a certain date and time. Um, and you, in here you can show locks for all users um, as well. So you can lock people out for a certain amount of time. Um, but I would say contact me and we'll help you get, get uh, password restrictions set up or if you wanna really seriously look into the linking up with Active Directory. Uh, can you design a way to gracefully kick someone off cam so we can perform bulk patch updates? That's been a struggle. What we're, so a lot of people struggle to, to perform patch updates and it gets worse if you're, if you have more users, of course, um, because it's not us, it's Windows not allowing us to replace the files. Um, the, we think the real solution is, is basically, um, pulling WinCams local. So you'd have one copy of WinCams on your server, and then every time you run a program, say you run invoices, then we say, is the copy of invoices on this workstation newer or, or uh, as new as the version on the server? If not, we pull the version on the server over, and then we run it from the workstation. So then nobody's actually running the one on the server ever, and that would um, allow us to replace things on the server anytime we want. So that's the solution. Um, yes, rebooting the server to kick them off, it would, they could still have a database lock, so you'd have to kill them, kill from the database. Another option for this is, again, our ISM agreement, then we will do the, uh, we will do all patch installations for you, we'll do them after hours if necessary, and uh, you won't ever have to think about it. Um, uh, so, I think those are all related to the same thing. Can we institute a 20 minute auto log off in activity? Um, yeah, we do have that actually in our, um, in, in our uh, trouble ticket system, we have a one hour log off because we wanted people, want, want, wanted our guys internally not to not, um, uh, not leave trouble tickets up overnight. So we have a one hour log off. Um, one thing that gets, we could certainly implement that. Um, one thing that gets, tricky about it is what do you do if somebody's in the midst of editing a record, right? So I've half edited or I'm creating a time card or something like that. And, I, and then do I, you know, I don't know, do I just, I guess, do I just cancel it? Cause I can't try to save it cause we don't want to save a bad record. Um, so we'll have to think about that, but um, I think that is certainly doable. Um, Virtual, when can the virtual memory issue with the Borland database engine go away? Um, actually, we do have news on that front. We are moving away from the Borland database engine. We have three programs. Joel has done three prototype programs, um, and they are working successfully, and they do not use uh, the Borland database engine, and so that error is not an issue anymore. Um, we are... At the same time, we're basically, it's a pretty big sea change. It, it, it's going to look, you know, the screens are going to look a little different. Um, I'm not sure, maybe they'll look a lot different. Uh, we're going to be utilizing queries much more. Um, I don't want to make any promises, but in our, uh, in our first, in, in the prototype, we've seen literally a hundred times faster reporting. So um, it's, pretty exciting, um, not, no joke, like a report that took two hours, like huge county, a whole year of time cards in the time card audit trail that took hours takes 25 seconds um, uh, in, the, in the new version. So not that that's related to the, to the BDE, um, but, um, but that is, that is the sort of, that's the squeeze that's causing us to want to move to it. Um, 
and uh, and and move to the more modern, um, you know, get get away from that because it's not supported anymore, and use a, a different way of interacting with the database. So um, it's a huge priority issue, and like I said, we have prototyped two out of the three. So we prototyped online programs and um, reports, and the last one would be prototyping uh, a posting program, and then we are gonna start trying to propagate them um, in fact you I, I actually can run them uh, I can't see my data my desktop let me see here um, just for fun you can see them so this is a version, a new version of WinCams that is running. We only have a few programs, but it's running without the um, without the BDE and using a new tool. And you can see here, it start it starts to look a little bit different. We haven't put much energy into the look and feel yet, but it already has different kinds of checkboxes and the tabs look a little different and um, we've got all these themes that we've been playing with like uh, um, you can thought here's slate classico and here is windows 10 blue right we've and so we're still in the planning stages of like do we do we make these things available to the user mostly we're trying to get it to work and it does work right as you can see it works um, but then we have to figure out like okay when you pick should we allow the users to choose choose these should we change the way our buttons look should we change the entire way we navigate any and things like that so that's just a, a sneak peek at what what we're doing but the point that i'm trying to make is that this activity codes program is not using the bde um, it is using a more a newer supported tool um, so we are getting away from that um, and as i said we have this we also have um, a time card audit trail and a vendor listing we have you know we've got we've started building some of the reports um just to just to prototype them make sure they work and then we're gonna have get other people involved to uh to start fleshing out the the rest of the system okay let's see here um okay diane from grace harbor says i have a question so back to accruals uh Comp you when comp time is cashed out, the earned code we use is UP so that it will back the hours out of the comp back at 1.5. Um, yes, so that's exactly what I said, showed in the beginning uh, when we were talking about that. So um, if you uh, let me run Grace Harbor, so there's a multiplier in the earned code screen when you tie the earned code to the accrual type. There's a multiplier in there that says what to do with, um, with regular hours versus overtime hours and how it, <clears throat> and how it affects your, um, your leave balances. So if I go to earn codes, uh, if Diane is accurate, she's got, should have one called UP. There it is. Oops. You comp use paid. So <clears throat> what this says is it's associated with comp time. And this checkbox means that it's going to reduce your comp time balance. And then all we need here is a 1.5. And now if any overtime hours that reference UP will now take 1.5 times the hours off of the comp time has no effect on the hours on the time card or what they get paid or anything, right? Um, it's just saying every hour I use, I use, uh, this doesn't actually make sense to me. I might wanna discuss it with you, Diane, a little more thoroughly. Usually we see it the other way when you, oh, oh wait, this is comp used paid, sorry, it, that's why. Okay, usually we see it as um, in comp earned. Like I when I work one hour and I wanna earn comp, then if it's overtime, I get, uh, 1.5 right 
um, times that 1.5 hours, but I don't want to show that I worked more more hours than I did. Now, it also may be that your question is more related to the way that you at Grace Harbor interact with your payroll system, and that may be custom for you. So, um, so, but this this section that you said here should work if you put it in as overtime in the um, in the time card, and then use that 1.5 multiplier. Okay, Bruce from Thurston County in Washington, Olympia, Washington. Uh, we post receipts to inventory, preferred to shop receipts, reconciliation, okay. I recently got an invoice for a product at an incorrect tax rate. They did not reissue a new invoice. They issued an invoice to cost correction. Is there a way to do a cost correction without doing either a shop inventory receipt entry to remove the product to the incorrect price and add the product to the correct price or a shop inventory price adjustment? That's a good question. So basically, he did a he did an inventory receipt through an invoice. He, he entered an invoice and posted it to create an inventory receipt. And let's say he bought 10 widgets at a dollar, including tax. Okay. And then it turned out that the vendor told him, oh, they weren't a dollar, they were a dollar twenty, um, because we used the wrong tax rate or something like that. Okay, so the problem there is that, it, it, I mean, it's easy to get the, the extra $2 or whatever to the bars or, or wherever. The trouble is that in your, um, is that we did, we average, we did some average costing. And that's where you gotta, you gotta decide how you wanna do it. If you haven't been using that item and charging it out, then I would do exactly what you said, Bruce. I would enter a negative receipt for the exact same, I would just copy the line right here, just copy the line and, and create a negative um, quantity and it will and we'll back it out and we will sort of back out the averaging, right? Um, and, but if you've, if you've already been, so let's say you bought 10, but you've already, you've already issued out three of them at the lower cost, then you gotta decide what you wanna do. And that's really up to you. I would look at how much it costs, you know, I don't know whether you want to, if you want to be precise, you would go back to those three issues and you would um, charge whatever they charge projects or or vehicles or whatever um, the the extra money that they should have paid. Um, if you if you wanted, uh, or you could calculate it and say, okay, I'm going to let those three issues go, and but then the next seven need to make up for it. So then I would put in an adjustment to raise the cost even higher going forward to make up for the missed cost you didn't distribute with the first three issues. Um, so I think my answer is really no, that you need you need to do one of those two things. You need to back out the receipt, negative and positive, or you need to do a price adjustment after you've done your own calculation. And the way I would determine whether to do that is based on how much, how many issues have been done with the stuff that you just bought. So if you bought a thousand gallons of fuel, put it in the wrong price, and by the time you realize that it was the wrong price, you've you've already issued out 300 of those gallons. Well, then you got to decide what to do. What I would probably do is take the price difference and then spread it across the 700 gallons remaining, and I would say, okay, so let's say let's just say for ease of it, you know, $70 price difference, 700 gallons remaining. So I'm going to increase the price by 10% so that when I when I push out, when I issue out that 700 gallons, I get my $70 back. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's the end of the, the questions that I received um, from um, via email. So I've been, I'm gonna go back through the chat and I, and this is a great time to um, send me more, put in more in the chat if you want. Okay, so Michelle says, what would be a best practice for conducting shop parts inventory counts? While conducting actual counts, the shop is still processing parts issues on repair orders. Is there a way to lock the inventory during this process? Um, <clears throat> so most people do inventory counts um, uh, at, um, at year end, some people do them more often than year end. Uh, you can do them as often as you like. Um, 
So let's talk about what a physical count means and what what it, what we're gonna what happens. So this is Jefferson County, Michelle, Port Towns in Washington. One of the few where I have never visited, but I expect to once uh, we can visit people again. Um, Jefferson County incidentally is involved in a <clears throat> super exciting project. Uh, you, you may know or you may have seen me demo a, um, a mobile app where that is, that is really designed for facilities service requests um, so that people can, so it interacts with CAMS and when you um, and, and when you assign a service request to a maintenance person, it shows up on their phone and then they can mark things completed, put in their hours, it updates their time cards in real time out in the field. It's pretty cool. Uh, Jefferson County has uh, partnered with us to expand that to general time card entry on phones or tablets in real time. Um, and so we are working on that right now. And what that means basically is a similar functionality, but the ability to just enter any kind of time. Uh, charging a road, charging a, a vehicle, charging a project. Um, you know, we got to deal with earn codes, different things. And so you can put in your, your, um, put in your time in the field. So I expect that to be completed before too long, or at least in going to test. And then um, I'm going to be showing it off to everyone at that point. So, uh, okay, so here's my shop inventory master. So at some point, what Michelle's saying is at some point, whether it's monthly or quarterly or yearly, they want to um, they want to go out and say, are there actually 475 um, gallons of unleaded in the tank, right? So they might be dipping a tank or they might have a readout. Um, something else like a cabin air filter is a little easier. We think there's one. Go look at the shelf. Is there one? Okay. So first of all, if you're doing this mid-year, then this is a moot point. If you do it at the end of the year, I really prefer to enter my adjustments in the old year, okay? So that my, because if there was something lost or not, or stolen or or just not tracked, um, th then I would, then I want the difference in inventory value to be born by the old year, not the new year. So some people, they wait until they start the new year, then they go do their account, and then their first transaction of the new year is an adjustment to get trued up, which is fine. You get you end up in the same place, but really it it burdens the new year with this, this change of inventory value, right? Because any adjustment is going to change your inventory value. Um, so, uh, so the real question Michelle is asking, is there a way to lock the inventory during this process? I don't think we have a way to do that. Um, what most people do is they they shut down data entry for a day or two while they're doing these counts. And if that's too big of a deal, then what they do is they say, well, we do these, you know, we 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 do our, I mean, I've even seen we do one aisle of our parts room uh, in, in one day and then we do the next aisle the next day right or something like that and or, or you know or one type of part or one shop one day and then their other location the next the, the next day and then they 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 sort of allow so it just means stacking up a few repair order forms or something like that in the meantime because you're absolutely right michelle if you are actively entering parts usage in wind cams at the same time as you're counting you're going to get really messed up right so if i have one on hand let's find something that has more than one Okay, so if I have 26, uh, I guess, containers of brake fluid um, on on hand, according to CAMS, at four dollars and sixty cents, and then I'm and then I go out there and I'm counting, and then I, well, actually, I guess it could be okay, especially if it's live. If you're if you're entering them in issues the live issues then well okay so here's what most people do they most people they go and they run a um they run an inventory listing report right and they add a column for the actual count okay and um 
So they put an actual count there. And maybe they sort it by bin location, right? So if you sort it by bin, then some people have really detailed bin locations. So you can just walk down the aisle and, and be in the right, it'll be, it'll be in the right order. Okay. So, um, So then they get, okay, uh, well, I did it by item number, but maybe, I, I don't know, maybe they have, oh, they have bins. Okay, let's use, let's do it by bin. So if they've set up their bins correctly, what this means is that bin A11 is maybe in the, in a certain area of the shop or a certain area of your yard or whatever, and you'll see things, all the air filters that go in that area together, right? So then you can just walk down and see. So this says, here's what here's here's the what Cams thinks the quantity on hand is, and then you can write in, or you can push this to Excel and put the and 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 create the um, put in the actual count. So I go and I count these air filters, and let's say there's three. If I'm using paper, I I write it in there. If I push it to Excel, I put it and I put it on a maybe a tablet or something. Maybe I can just type three. Maybe I can make another column in Excel that says the difference. And then I come back to WinCams and I, the ones that are off, I go in and I enter an adjustment for that item, right? And 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 get it to the and, and adjust it by the difference, right? Now the problem with what Michelle's saying is that if in the meantime, since this report was printed or pushed to Excel, if in the meantime this changed from 26 to um, because it's being used regularly down to 24, I got to be careful. Right. And then I'm and then it would be more, you know, then I, I want to just be careful that I if let's say it was 26 when I printed the report, then I go and I count and there's 22 on hand. Well, then I might set up my spreadsheet to say, OK, the adjustment is four. But. But actually, there's four issues that have come in while I'm walking around counting. Well, then cams is actually right. So then you've got just, it, it, it's fine, but you got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples here. Now, so um, in the adjustment, note that you, each adjustment line, you either adjust the quantity or the unit cost. You do not adjust both at the same time because we can't handle the change in, in inventory value. So if you want to adjust both the quantity and unit cost, which some people do, they say, well, if the quantity goes down, I need to incre increase the unit cost so that I still, you know, that I, just because I lost them or, stolen or or failed to track them i still need to recoup that money right well then so so you you do the and when you are entering an adjustment you enter the quantity of the adjustment so if i want 26 to go down to 22 i put in negative four when you're entering the unit cost that's why it says new unit cost you actually put in the new unit cost you don't put in the difference if you want it to be three dollars instead of two dollars you put in three dollars and then each line can have a value of change right so if I go find my, um, so Hadlock shop dot three and four break fluid. So Hadlock shop. So dot three and four break fluid. It says there's 26 on hand at 460 and I want it to be negative four. Okay. Wants me to confirm what's going on, that my value is going from 119 down to 101. So negative value of neg or, uh, I'm going to complete the adjustment value. I just I just lost $18. So that means if they were, you know, hopefully they were used on cars and not tracked. But if they were, if they walked away or they were destroyed or they were in, I don't know, you know. So then some people say, well, I want to recoup that $18. So I'm going to get out my calculator and I'm going to update the unit cost to make it higher on another line and make the unit cost. Um, uh, you know, 485, right? I don't get the same amount back, but this can help help me, right? I would have, I would have had to do that right, but you get the idea, okay? And then we also have um, we have uh, barcode scanning options, and one of, that's one of the best features about the barcode scanner is it allows you to go around, and if you have stickers or something on your shelves, you can just you can put it in count mode. You scan the the you scan the barcode. It knows what what item it is, and then you just count and you put in okay. There's 22, and then when you load the barcode scanner back into cams, that information we will automatically create that that adjustment, right? 
And so that one works even better for people still entering issues because what we are creating the adjustment against is at the time you dock it. So then you can be going around and counting for three days and then you say, okay, everybody stop for just a second while I dock and then it'll compare the 22 to the current value. Yes, it'll compare. Well, actually I take that back. That doesn't work. So I still think that it'd be really good to stop, have people stop using it or be very clear, have a very clear, like, you know, let me check if there's any usage of these items. You know, let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm doing inventory on this shelf or on this storeroom. If you need anything from the storeroom, let me know and we'll have a list. Okay. And we are also working with our barcode scanner provider, GSD, to have an updated version that has way cooler features. It, uh, the number one feature is that it's live, no more docking. So you would put in an issue, you'd just be able to scan the your repair order form and scan your part and it would put the part right on your repair order in real time, Bluetooth, um, or or not, actually not, blue, not Bluetooth, it's uh, it's through your Wi-Fi. And, um, and the other thing that's cool is that it can actually do lookups. So you don't, so it can say, okay, well, it can tell us some things about that part, it can, like the name of it, or it can, you can look up a, a vehicle number if you need to, that kind of stuff. So we're upgrading that. But in answer to your question, no, we do not have a way to lock the inventory during this process. Um, what you might, if you really can't control your staff, we could talk about a lock, but what I would probably recommend is going in and putting in a, a login lock on, on some of these users, um, like we talked about before. Okay, Amber asked, can we set up pay rates by individual employee? And I'm sorry if you if there are follow-up questions on these things. I can only see a little bit of the chat, frankly. So I only see one, one at a time, but we'll get to them, hopefully. Can we set up pay rates by individual employee rather than by employee category? Um, I believe we do have the option to, um, to override the pay rate right in the employee master. I, and what Amber means is employee, uh, she's talking about the job classifications. So I believe we do have the ability to um, to enter rates directly into the um, employee master. Um, and that's particularly because some of our account clients use bands, they call them bands. And that means if you're a, if you're a, a accounting technician one, that we can't say how much you make necessarily, um, but we know you make between this range and then it's a, I guess it's a subjective thing, how much you actually would make. And so, um, so then you, that if, in that case, you, we can't just pull your, your, uh, pull it from your, um, from your job class, we would actually, you'd have to go in here and, and type in here. So I can turn that on for you or discuss the, the details of that if you don't want to go through the idea of setting up job classes and steps and things like that, okay. Um, Chrissy, if you have a multiple prepayment from a client who has multiple projects, does post credit balances let you choose which prepayment goes to which invoice? Um, no, it does not. Um, no, you would, no, because it's a posting program, it's a batch program. Um, so if you had, so if you have a client, if I have three projects going on and I have uh, three different invoices, or I'm sorry, and I sent you three different checks and then three different invoices came up, I'm gonna just apply them in date order. Um, now, normally it's not an issue because they're, well, it's, it works fine. I think if you really want to do it that way, what I would do is maybe create multiple clients because, yeah, th that's the problem. If you want to select, then, yeah, you're, you're, we'll ha we'd have to figure that out. If you want to select, then we can't do it as a batch process, right? So I think you might like, well, I think you're already, um, you're already mentioning that it's all the same client number. So I think that maybe it might be easier to have sub client numbers or, or very, you know, sub clients or sort of, if you're going to be doing that a lot. Um, 
Jennifer says, can AR invoices have the same option for printing? Right now I can only print and I would like to be able to print a PDF. So they all do. Yes, all of our printing, um, I mean, even this right here's a little, uh, this is just a print uh, report that's a, just a dump of every activity code, right? It's not a real report, but anywhere that we print, we have this, and then if you go to print setup, so I clicked on the white piece of paper, if I go to print setup, I can click here, and I've got, uh, I don't actually have a PDF printer, but most of you do, QPDF or Adobe PDF writer. Um, I can write, I have a Microsoft XPS document writer, okay? And so I say, okay, and um, do I always want it, do I want it to remember that when I print my activity listing, I want it to do that? Sure. So then when I go to print, you should see, why did it not do what I wanted it to do? Oh, okay, that's why, because I actually have to print it to the printer, not to the form. So or to, okay, so then this is just like a PDF. It's, I don't, just don't have a PDF writer. So if I um, write to XPS document writer, then if I go into my desktop and I should be able to find that file and it looks a lot like a PDF as you can see, there you go. It's Microsoft's version of PDF, but you, but if you have a PDF writer, you can choose that as your printer and it will, print to PDF, and you can make that your default printer. That's no problem. But like I said, we are also working on us pushing to PDF. We just need to figure out the, um, you know, directly um, figure out the, the details of that. Um, okay, let's keep going here. When printing a purchase and invoice payment summary, is it any way to have it print the page numbers? Uh, that was from Jenna Davis. I'm not sure what a purchase and invoice payment summary is, Jenna. Um, we definitely have page numbers on our reports. Uh, if you're talking about AP invoices, um, if I go into, I, I'm not sure. It could be that this is a this is a very specific report for Jenna, or maybe a custom report that I'm not remembering. But when we print. Um, Maybe, maybe this is your claim form, I'm wondering. Um, if so, the answer is yes. We do this on forms a lot. We certainly do it in any uh, any of our regular reports. Um, we, we have page numbers. We don't say of how many, of course, um, not of course, but we, we, but, um, but in our forms, we do have one of two, one of three, uh, things like that. So um, maybe send me an email, Jenna, and, and we'll, get more details on that or maybe you put it in the chat later uh, Brenda asked how does an inactive employee status affect multi-year reports is there time included on a time card audit trail or project reports this was a really confounding issue when we first did multi-year reports I believe that what it I'd have to test it but I believe that what we settled on is that if they are inactive that, that we are checking their status in the in, in the year from which you run it. So if I'm running this one, this report in 2020, and I say I only want to see active something, you know, projects or some sort of status, right? Active, I don't know what, um, active vendors maybe. Um, then I believe we check the status of that vendor in this fiscal year, not in each individual fiscal year. But I'm not 100% sure on that. So I think we'd have to test it. Um, okay, Sue was following up, looking to electronically send AR statements in-house. Okay, so we'll, uh, Sue, let's, I'll, I'll make a note to reach out to you and, um, and we'll, because we are doing that uh, PDF stuff right now in order to send actually the PDFs to a payment processor. Um, so, um, but we'll, then we'll be able to do it um, for, for in-house as well. Um, print to, and the problem actually isn't um, isn't printing to the PDF. Like I said, you can choose your printer, and we think we're printing to a printer, but it's going to a PDF. The trouble is that m when people print to a PDF, they don't just want a long string. I don't want a hundred clients, and then have you know, then you need to get a PDF 
parser or, or some some other tool to break them apart or you need to run it one at a time so we either need to automate that process which says like a checkbox in your statement running that says rerun the report or the statement one at a time and then just you know and we need to you know you'll end up with a whole bunch of files or we need some sort of automated process there to break up that that batch okay i think i already answered what what about allocating direct costs looking for an automated process okay jenna when printing a journal can a setting be made to have the account numbers listed in ascending order similar to how an ap invoice is ordered um so again i don't know when you're saying printing a journal maybe you're saying a journal form um yeah we can certainly add a setting we, we can sort your journal form uh differently if if you want um so it's different than the order i believe right now it should just come out in the order that it's on the journal but if you wanted a different order we can certainly do that just send me an email and we'll look into it kathy asks is there a report that shows activity costs that include refunds entered on cash receding um, I typically use the time card distribution so report, but it doesn't pick up refunds. That has been a um, an issue that that has come up before. Um, adding um, adding revenues to the time card distribution report, um, and it's uh, it's been on our list for a while. Um, And we also need to change the name of it because it's m much bigger than a time card distribution report. Um, so yeah, we need to add cash receipt revenues or, or AR revenues to to these as well to this report as well. Um, but usually, when you want to see that kind of stuff, you're uh, who was this, Kathy? Um, usually, I I prefer when I'm thinking about so. You know, I've probably you probably heard me talk about the posting curtain. So you have source documents, time cards, invoices, equipment usage, materials, journals, et cetera, et cetera. AR invoices, cash receipts, et cetera. And then and those are all coming in, you think of it like a big uh and they all come in from the outside into a central place, a project, a vehicle, an AR client, a a, a whatever, right? And so you usually want to think about it from that perspective. Um so so when you're talking about I don't care where the where the source was, I want the activity that happened on this vehicle. Well, then, of course, doesn't matter where it comes from. If it hits that vehicle, we should be able to show it. If it hits that project, we should be able to show you revenues and expenditures. If it hits that, uh, I don't know, roads don't usually have revenues, but you know something else. So I would be look want to be I want to I'd want to dig in further into what you're, you know, what you're actually reporting on and see if we can sort of look at it from the other side you know a lot of people you talk about the source stuff because they want a great deal of detail but that's also where i recommend a project cost source report or a uh, you know our cost source reports will take the what has been posted to that ledger and then dig out the 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 source documents so um but the so so i would maybe try to steer you away from the time card distribution report but i need to learn more about what you're trying to do Uh, purchase an invoice payment summary references when you are printing the payment of an invoice, AP invoice, i.e. an IPS. Yeah, see, these are all county-specific terms. No one else knows what an IPS is. So, okay, you're talking, so I think you're talking about what some people call a claim form, some people call a voucher form, whatever. It's uh, it's from the invoice itself. Um, and and you can or you can print you know we're basically printing a customized form so if i think you want a page number on there um yeah we certainly can do that um the best thing to do would be to send me an email but i'll make a, a note of it um uh, page numbers on claims claims vouchers uh request for payments authorization for payments whatever they're called uh okay there we go all right oh it's 1202 wow um okay i don't see anything more in the chat so uh and i think this is when we were supposed to end anyway uh we can do it again if you have any questions at all you can always email me aaron at cascadegovsoftware.com my first name is a-y-r-e-n um 
and uh, or you can email um, support at cascadegovsoftware.com um, if you have any questions at all and we'll try to route it to the correct person. Um, thanks for all your questions and uh, we will, um, the next webinar scheduled is September 8th. Uh, AR and cash receipts. We also have, I also have a gener gener general basic training webinar coming up on September 15th and a fleet webinar on September 17th. Those are all day webinars and those do cost money, but we're gonna go really in depth into how to set everything up and, and all that. And then of course, we've got, we've now moved our um, main user group conferences because we unfortunately cannot go uh, meet in person with, you know, the, all the laws and, and all that, it's not safe. So we're moving our user group conferences to online. It's still planning for two days. I'm still gonna do a lot of the same stuff and uh, the, cut the price in half. Uh, and uh, let me know if, if you, you should have already received an, an invitation to that, or you can go to our website, cascadegovsoftware.com and um, see more information about it. Thanks everyone uh, for attending and hope you have a great day.